What's your opinion on when it makes sense to take antibiotics and when it doesn't? When it makes sense to take any drug, including an antibiotic, is when the risk that you're going to take is worth the benefit you're going to get. All right? We overprescribe antibiotics. And it's a two-way street. Doctors overprescribe them. And then patients and their parents ask for them. And so doctors overprescribe, but then they are reluctant to not overprescribe because they're getting demand from the parents. And they're prescribed for things for which they can't possibly help, like viral infections and things of that nature. But, but here's the thing. If you really do have a life-threatening bacterial infection, an antibiotic will save your life. So people say, well, antibiotics are terrible because they destroy your gut bacteria. Well, if you're going to die from a bacterial infection, you're better off being an alive person taking a probiotic than a dead person with an intact gut, right? So, so the risk-benefit ratio works out to take the antibiotic. So going back to what I was talking about earlier about being an informed consumer, that's really what making smart medical decisions is all about. Here's the risk I'm going to take, the benefit I'm going to get, and do those things work out? Or is it skewed in favor of not taking the drug? What do you do if you have autoimmune disease? Autoimmune diseases are different. Um, they're all similar to one another, by the way. It's the same mechanism. The, body, the body's immune system is misbehaving, and it has lost its ability to tell the difference between you and not you. So your immune system should be going after bacteria and viruses and things that can hurt you, not your liver, your gallbladder, your pancreas, and your thyroid, right? Um, the different thing about autoimmune diseases is unlike cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes and many forms of cancer, those are pretty much foodborne illnesses. You eat your way in and you eat your way out. The issue with autoimmune diseases is they're caused by a number of different things. So you have to address a whole lot of different things in order to fix it, right? So 78% of all autoimmune diseases are diagnosed in women. There's a very strong hormonal component. And in many instances, hormonal dysregulation actually is in the medical history of the woman. So you'll see PMS, irregular menstrual periods, heavy bleeding. Many of these women have taken oral contraceptives in order to control their menstrual cycles and be able to live <laughs> normal lives. Um, infertility, fertility treatments, that sort of, so there's a hormonal component. Vaccinations. In fact, the, the language in some medical journal articles is quite clear that vaccinations can cause autoimmune because it the vaccinations abnormally perturb the immune system. And if you do that enough times, um, you'll, you'll end up perhaps switching it on and you won't be able to switch it off. Allergies are precursors. So that's a situation that has to be addressed. The gut microbiome has usually been damaged. That's where your immune system is controlled. So the key to addressing an autoimmune disease is the diet has to change. There are additional restrictions for people who have autoimmune disease. You have to fix the gut microbiome. You have to fix the hormonal imbalances. Um, you have to fix the allergies. You have to have some strong consideration about whether or not you're going to continue the vaccination schedule because some of the worst flares of autoimmune diseases happen post-vaccine, particularly for flu. Um, so those are the things that you have to do to address autoimmune. The problem with, the, with, with conventionally raised livestock and farmed fish is that it's so contaminated, antibiotic steroids and hormones, um, that, that you can't afford to eat it. And, and maybe, the, uh, for one thing, the hormones are an issue, but back to our discussion about antibiotics, the antibiotics are a life-threatening issue. You know, 70 some percent, varies depending on what study you look at, but over 70 percent of antibiotics manufactured in the United States are injected into or in the animal feed of um, livestock and farmed animals and fish. And they do this for two reasons. For some reason that nobody's ever been able to determine, antibiotics stimulate growth. So you can grow the fish and the pigs or whatever you're growing faster. And the other thing is you prevent infection in these very overcrowded facilities. Well, we really are reaching a place right now where antibiotic-resistant bacterial infections, we're, we're going to have sooner or later something catastrophic happen if we don't change our ways in this area. So people who say, I've never taken an antibiotic in my life, if you've been eating conventionally grown animal foods and farmed fish, you've been eating antibiotic with every meal that contained that stuff for a very long time. Should everyone supplement with B12? Is one type of B12 better than others? And how do you make sure you get enough B12? 
Yeah, so B12, uh, the B12 requirements for adults, really small, 2.4 micrograms a day, very tiny amount. Um, most people don't need to supplement with B12. Vegans who eat no animal food and who eat no processed fortified foods need to supplement. But most plant milks, most of us are taking in, I, I happen to eat a vegan diet, I'm taking in enough B12 from fortified plant milks and things like that that I don't need to take a, a B12 supplement. Um, in terms of the type of B12, I don't think it matters a lot. I think a lot of people with a lot of time on their hands like to sit around and ponder these types of things that are not so significant. <laughs> so if you're a vegan who doesn't eat processed foods that, that are fortified, then you should take a B12 supplement. Um, the problem that we have is the B12 supplements on the market are huge doses. I mean, it's difficult to find something even as low as 50 micrograms a day. And um, I remember when I first started in this business before I really became a nut about the science and I was repeating things other people told me, I would tell people, oh, you can't overdose on this stuff. There's no, there, there's no evidence that, that it can hurt you in big amounts. But as I got smarter about all this and I started doing my own research, um, there is some evidence that huge doses can hurt you and that um, there really have never been controlled studies to determine the upper tolerable limit. So be cautious in taking it. Yes, you should take it if you're a vegan eating no fortified foods. Um, I will say this, interestingly enough, most of the B12 deficiencies take place in people eating animal foods, which are rich in B12, so how can that be? It's because there are more gastrointestinal disorders in people who eat an animal foods-based diet. So they have problems in their GI tract, including the production of intrinsic factor, which allows you to utilize, absorb and utilize B12. So the fear is always when, when particularly people who promote an animal foods-based diet, oh, all those vegans are going to be B12 deficient. Look at your own population. They're much more likely to be B12 deficient than any of us. Should we take blue-green algae, and are there B12 analogs in it that cause real B12 to not be absorbed properly? Well, that's a complicated issue. I, I don't think any, there's any mandate to take blue-green algae. And I think people would be better off if they focused on food and spent their money on high quality food than a lot of the supplements that they buy. I think supplements should be subject to the same risk benefit ratio. And the fact that you don't know what the risks are because it's never been looked at should scare you a little more than it usually does. But in any case, the, the, the problem is not that the analogs in, in blue-green algae are going to interfere with you know, taking a B12 supplement, as much as it is that the analogs are often promoted by people who don't know better as a substitute for being concerned about B12. So when we were talking about B12, if you're, if you're eating a vegan diet, you don't eat any fortified foods, and you think you're going to take an algae supplement, and that's going to provide you with the B12 that you need, you're going to be sadly mistaken. And although it may take seven or eight years for you to develop a deficiency because the body stores and recirculates B12, eventually bad things are going to happen. Brian Clement from Hippocrates Health Institute recommends all beans except soybeans and black beans. Do you agree with this? I can't imagine why there would be a problem with soybeans or black beans. You know, this is hard enough to get people to do, to eat well without putting restrictions that just make it harder. Uh, and I have never seen any evidence, and I'd like to see if there is some. Please give it to me. I'm happy to review it. I usually don't hear from people after I do that. It's too much work. Talk is cheap. Evidence requires effort. So it's easy to be me, because I come up with the evidence. Your job is to refute it if you're going to take me on on this issue, and then you have to work hard. People don't want to do that. That's just an aside, by the way. But anyway, I've never seen any evidence that there's a problem with soy or black beans. Thank you.